there's legal cardboard in the food system. And at some point, somebody has to stand up and say, that's not food. You can only ever use the present moment to be healthy. If you're in a hole, you got to stop digging. The fact that it isn't just that we're being fooled on a physical standpoint with lack of nutrition, but on a mental standpoint with the way that it's packaged, the way that it's presented, the way that it's marketed, you know, it is a constant barrage on the physical and mental front. What you want to do is sever the link between your emotions and overeating. It really is something that gives hope to individuals that I know in my life right now feel a little bit hopeless. That would involve you know, eating well about 90% of the time and, and indulging about 10% of the time, but your decisions are made for you. You don't have to make chocolate decisions all week long. You're not wearing down your willpower. You say, why can't I stop eating? What's wrong with me? You're directing your brain to go find evidence that you can't stop eating and that there's something wrong with you. If you keep directing your brain like that, you're going to believe it. I did listen to your book. I take it you didn't hate it since I'm still here. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was really, really good. But okay. it actually caused a lot of questions in my head. Like when you go into the discussion, you like so freely share that you call that inner part of you, your inner pig. And then you talk about how words are significant and have power. So it just caused me to go, hmm, so what kind of power did calling those cravings and that thrust for you to, to eat, even when you knew it wasn't what you desired to do, what caused you to call it an inner pig? Yeah. So, so I used to be a really heavy person. I'm not just a doctor that wanted to work with overeaters, but I was almost 300 pounds myself. And I, I spent a lifetime trying to love myself then. I come from a family of 17 psychotherapists um, and my, my mom and my dad and my stepmom and my stepdad and my sister and her husband. And everybody's, a, when something breaks in the house, everybody knows how to ask it, how it feels and nobody knows how to fix it. Um, but that's, that's relevant because I'll, be, I'll get to your question in a second. Yeah. I began my journey trying to love myself then. I really thought that I must have a hole in my heart. And if I could fill that hole in my heart, then I wouldn't have to keep trying to fill the hole in my stomach. And so I went to the best therapists and I went to Overeaters Anonymous and I had a spiritual awakening and, and I went to psychiatrists, I took medications and everything, everything helped me as a person. It made me more compassionate for myself. I didn't hate myself as much, but it didn't really help me with my eating. I'd get a little better and then fatter again. I get a little thinner and a lot fatter, a little thinner and a lot fatter. Um, and over the course of many years, probably about two decades, I took a journey where I slowly recognized that there were external forces that didn't have anything to do with my personal psychology that were that had me kind of trapped in a habit loop. Um, you know, I, I consulted for big food in addition to my clinical practice. Uh -huh. I was um, I was on the wrong side of the war. I was helping sell, you know, sugar and, you know, oils and excitotoxins to, you know, to the public. And I feel very guilty about it now. I am, I, I'm trying to make up for it. Uh, but long story short, just kind of fast forwarding to what actually worked for me was I, I had to switch paradigms. At some point, I had to stop trying to love myself thin and recognize that there was this part of my anatomy, my, my reptilian brain, that um, doesn't really know logic or love. It knows eat, mate, or kill. It's like a bad college drinking game. And it's a very powerful part of our anatomy. It's the part of us that is responsible for our survival. Mm -hmm. um, so really prioritize the acquisition of calories and nutrition when those opportunities are available. And that the big food companies are targeting that part of the brain um, with these hyper palatable concentrations of starch and sugar and fat and oil and salt and excitotoxins. And they're designed to hit the bliss point in the reptilian brain without giving us enough nutrition to feel satisfied. And then you know, all the fat cats in white suits with mustaches are really, really good at advertising this stuff so that we think that we need it to survive. And people think that advertising doesn't affect them, but I can tell you from all of my experience, it affects you more when you think that 
because your sales resistance is down. So they're very powerful forces in society that are targeting this part of your brain that has the ability to push your rational thinking out of the way. Okay, what does this have to do with why I called my reptilian brain my inner pig and how, that, how did that help me? Um, you don't have to call it a pig. You can call it your food monster. You can call it your inner Betty or, or whatever you want to call it. Um, but I did need a way to know when this thing was active. And I needed a way to wake up. I needed something that would stimulate a very primitive feeling. Um, I know all this in retrospect. It was just an experiment that I did on my own. I wasn't going to teach this back then. And so what would happen was I would make a rule. Like, I will never have chocolate on a weekday again. And that way, if I was in a Starbucks and there was a chocolate bar at the counter and I heard this voice in my head that said, you know what, Glenn, even though you said you're not going to have chocolate on a weekday and today is Wednesday, you worked out hard enough. This this is not going to ruin your, your, you're not going to gain any weight. It's really fine. It'll be just as easy to start your silly diet tomorrow. Yippee, go ahead and get some. Let's go have it. I would say, wait a minute, that's not me. That's my inner pig. Chocolate on a Wednesday is pig slop. I don't eat pig slop. I don't let farm animals tell me what to do. That started this whole journey. That, like that's what, that was the origin of what created the foundation that let me get better. What I know now is that it set up a kind of a trip wire where there were healthy thoughts and unhealthy thoughts about food. Like if I use my best thinking to come up with a rule that I wanted to follow, then I had thoughts that would suggest that I could follow it and then thoughts that I would suggest that I couldn't. I, this allowed me to wake up when those thoughts were just starting to become active when I could still control them, right? And it it shoved a wever between stimulus and response. Before, there was an automation loop that was going on. You know, smell of coffee, had a good workout, see the chocolate bar at the counter, um, eat the chocolate bar. It was almost as if I wasn't there through the whole process, taking out the money, paying for it, going to my car, going to the back of the parking lot, opening it and eating it. Um, it. It's almost as if that was all on an automatic loop. And I know now that the brain really looks to automate the acquisition of um, you know, calories and nutrition. And these are, these are, the modern food environment has so many sources of concentrated calories without nutrition um, that, we didn't evolve with on the savannah. Like we we didn't we didn't have chocolate bars and Doritos and Pop Tarts and pizza and pasta on the savannah. And so these things, they create these automatic habit loops. And this is one way. This is a way that I happen to have figured it out for myself. I was not going to teach it to pry apart, to set up a trip wire. It's like a fire alarm that went off as soon as the the reptilian brain was active. Um, and it gave me an opportunity to do all sorts of things in that in that space. So that that's why I called it a pig. I find that it's perfectly possible for people to recover. I've worked with over 2,000 people at this point. It's perfectly possible for people to recover without calling it a pig. Um, um, but you do need something. What doesn't work is to think of it as your inner wounded child. What doesn't work is to think, think of it as this part of you that was lonely and abandoned and you know used the chocolate to survive even though it might be true that that's how this habit loop started the habit loop is so strong and the stimuli are so strong in society that you need a shock to the system you, you have to be able to have something that wakes you up and you say whoa who's in charge here i don't want this thing to be in charge i want to be in charge um so that was the basis of how my recovery started i can tell you what i did from there if you want to or you can ask me more questions about my inner pig well, there's like a million questions that we can ask just based on what you said. I mean, when you talk about you can't only focus on the in wounded inner child and feel like that's going to take away your cravings and your book, Defeat Your Cravings, that's a key part of it is, yes, you can do all of this stuff to make yourself feel better. But if you don't do something to break the habit pattern, then it's not going to stop the outcome that has resulted as a root of what you created, what, however it started. And I feel like you in your book have done an amazing job of talking about so many aspects of that. And you brought it up in that conversation from the power that you give that inner craving or that inner pig and however it pulls you out and gives you a time gap 
to the power of words in general, especially when that inner voice, we'll keep calling it the inner pig because I like it. I think it's very helpful for us to create that separation and have that time gap. So when you talk about having that, okay, we have a stimulus, which is food, and then we have a little bit of time to have a response, but consciously we can create a wider gap in that so we can make conscious choices. Yes. How does your program speak to that? Um, okay. Could I expand a little bit on the concept of emotional eating and then and then go to address the making of a space between stimulus and response? I would love it because I have someone very close to me who's been told their entire life that their emotions are the root for their eating. After reading your book, I'm going to make sure they have a copy because I feel like you make such strong points in that area. So yeah, Thank absolutely. You. Thank you. Hi, I'm your host, Amber, and I am here with Austin on the Heart Leader Podcast. We are so grateful that you are tuning in to be with us. To never miss an episode, take a moment right now to click the subscribe button below and give us a like so we know we're creating content that you really enjoy. So it's true that the nervous system has difficulty conducting the emotions when you overload the digestive system with food. Um, you're taking energy away from the nervous system. And so this is the anesthetic effect that people feel of food. This is why people say that, oh, I need comfort food. I just need mm -hmm. comfort food. Um, and this has led to the belief in the culture, which is only partially true. It's only a small part of the story that overeating is driven by emotional distress or emotional trauma. And, you know, there's the classic Golden Girls episode where something happens to one of the girls and one of the women and they say, okay, who's going to go get the cheesecake? And they go and they go to town on cheesecake. Um, and everybody laughs and, you know, but they're actually creating a habit pattern that's very hard to, to break. So emotions can be the stimulus that that sets the pattern off, but they're not really the cause or they're not the, they're not the sole cause. Um, so here are the complicating factors. First of all, there is that time between stimulus and response where usually the brain wants to justify why it's okay. Nobody could go through a breakup with their boyfriend without cheesecake, right? Um, yeah, the you, golden you, girls say so. Right. <laughs> you, you, you can just start your silly diet tomorrow. There's no reason you have to do this today. It'll be just as easy. Well, you can, you have an opportunity to disempower that justification and change that greased shoot, which moves from emotional stimulation to cheesecake. You can reduce that grease shoot um, and you kind of pour uh, sawdust and glass on it by looking at what your pig is saying, what justification is it giving? Um, and in this case, the idea that it'll be just as easy to start tomorrow, it's not true. The way that the brain works, if you look into this, that if you have a craving and you have the thought that says, I can just start tomorrow, and then you have cheesecake, you are reinforcing the craving and you're reinforcing the thought. So tomorrow, you're more likely to have the thought, I can just start tomorrow. And tomorrow, you're going to have a stronger craving for cheesecake. And so you can only ever use the present moment to be healthy. If you're in a hole, you got to stop digging. Right. That's an example of a rational refutation. That's an example of disempowering the excuse, pouring sawdust and glass on that previously very comfortable grease chute that you used to go down. Um, that can be very helpful in stopping intervening with that habit loop. Okay. So there's the rationalization. You could, you could think of that like if there were a fireplace around a roaring fire in the living room and the roaring fire was the emotional upset, your pig is poking holes in the fireplace with these crazy rationalizations and you can plug the holes in the fireplace so that it doesn't matter how strong the fire is as long as it's well contained. As a matter of fact, that's actually an asset, not a liability. People gather around a fire and make memories and cry and laugh and hug. and, and um... yeah. So that's one complication in the emotional eating stream. The other complication is that when you have an emotion, there's usually a physiological component of that emotion. The psychologists that study emotion, they know that one way to define an emotion is as a physiological state of excitation 
coupled with a cognitive label. Um, so for example, both anxiety and excitement have the same more or less physiological profile, um, but they have a different cognitive label. So um, if you feel anxious, a lot of people tell me they can't get to bed without having a boatload of carbs because they just feel too anxious. And I say, well, did you know when you feel anxious, your blood pressure goes up a little bit and so does your galvanic skin response and your heartbeat and your respiration and your perspiration and, and you know a lot of other things in your body that we can measure. And in animal studies, when they give animals a sugar reward when those signs are present, for example, they did this with baboons. And when the baboons demonstrated higher blood pressure, they gave them a sugar reward. That group of baboons, although the moment you give it to them, the blood pressure goes down a little bit. As a whole, their regular measurement of blood pressure went up on a regular basis. So what's happening there is that your body and your brain are looking for physiological states that seem to result in the acquisition of calories. So you're actually reinforcing the anxiety. You're making your anxiety worse by eating the carbs, not better. It's better for a very short short thing. This, this happens with smoking also, by the way. Smoking brings you down a little bit, but it brings everything else up you know, all the time, except when you're smoking. And so it's not just emotions causing overeating, it's overeating's causing the emotion also. So, so you gotta break the pattern. One of the ways I suggest that people do that is to stop telling themselves that they're comforting with food or they're numbing out. Because, I mean, let's face it, if you, if you were really just numbing out with food, then when you went to the dentist, if he was out of Novocaine, he'd say, let me just inject you with a bagel, right? Or give you, give you a bar of chocolate. That's you're not, not a what- donut. You're okay, yeah. Yeah, right? <laughs> What you're actually doing is getting high with food. You're, you're seeking an unnatural concentration of starch or sugar or salt or some other excitotoxin to overload the nervous system so that you can't process the emotions the same way. So you're, you're getting high with food. It's, it's perfectly legal. You're not gonna wake up married to your new husband, Bubba, in a cell with four gray walls because you, you know, had too many donuts. Um, it's a perfectly legal drug, but it's a drug. It's a drug, right? Um, okay, so now, now I just wanted to make sure that people understand the problem with the traditional conception of overeating. Um, when you ask me, how do you make that space between stimulus and response? And the, the first part of it is to set up a rule, to set up a tripwire. So I ask people to think of, set the bar low to start with. Think of one simple thing that they could and would do that's not going to cause them to lose a ton of weight tomorrow, but it's going to put them in the right direction. It's kind of like if you had a ship that was going from New York to London and you realize you had to get back to New York, um, it's not going to get you back to New York tomorrow, but it's going to start you turning around the ship so you know you're doing the right thing. This is really important because most people live on this feast and famine roller coaster where either they're dieting really well or they're binging really well, right? They go like, up and down and up and down and up and down. And most most people are yo-yoing like that all the time. And actually they kind of gradually go up and up and up when they do that. Um, so we want to go to kindergarten before we go to college and start with something simple. Also so that you can observe yourself winning the game every day for a while. Because if you observe yourself winning the game, you're going to start to feel like a winner. Your identity function will kick in and say, like, for example, if I always, if my rule is that I will always put my gym clothes out before I go to bed at night and I see the gym close in the morning, every, every morning when I wake up, I start to think, I must be a guy who goes to the gym. I must be a guy who, I must be a gym goer. And you start to develop this identity as a gym goer. And then before you know it, you're thinking, well, what else do gym goers do? You know, how else? It, so you want to start with a small thing. So you set up a simple rule and that functions as a tripwire. Because if I say I will always put my clothes out to go to the gym before I go to bed, then anytime I'm about to go to bed and there's some thought in my head that says, oh, you're too tired, you'll do it in the morning. I say, wait a minute, that's not me. So that that, that way you're awake and, and you're intervening in the automaticity of those habit loops. Um, then what you want to do is pause. You just want to go one, two, three. And you might have to do this for a couple of weeks before it feels right. It's not going to feel natural. Um, your, your brain is really working hard to automate everything, which was a survival advantage. Thank goodness we have this capacity because 100,000 years ago, food was scarce. And if we didn't 
automate the acquisition of food, we would have starved. So that was a survival advantage. Your brain thinks that if it doesn't automate it, that it's going to die. Right? So, and, and by the way, rest was a scarce opportunity also. So when there's an opportunity for rest, the brain wants to automate that opportunity as well. So you're, you're going to need to learn to pause. You're going to need to develop a pause muscle between stimulus and response so that you can start de-automating these, these loops. And it's not going to feel natural. Um, I tell people to do this every time before they eat anything. Just go one, two, three. And you're going to hate me when you do it at first. It's going to seem like I'm getting in the way between you and a steaming hot plate of food. Um, but if you do it anyway, you're going to find yourself just that much calmer, making you know slightly more rational, more mindful decisions about the food that you do eat. One, two, three. Um, once you're doing that, oh, and by the way, you can do that also if you hear your pig say, go ahead and just start tomorrow, or one bite's not going to hurt, or you know, you're on a date, you don't want them to think that you're weird, you, you really have to... Um, you really have to have this tiramisu along with them um, from my own life. And, yeah. and real life and, examples, yeah. Real life examples. Um, then what you want to do is breathe. I, I, I once had lunch with this woman who found out what I did for a living. And she said, oh, I used to binge eat all the time at night before bed until I started doing 20 minutes of yoga instead. And now I don't even want to. And I couldn't figure out, I was really intrigued. I was already doing a little bit of yoga, but I was really intrigued what the heck was going on there. And I inquired a little more about it and she didn't really know what it was. She just knew that yoga made her not want to do it. So I started asking yoga teachers and they said what they thought was that the breathing in yoga and the techniques themselves, but particularly the breathing was something that was called parasympathetic breathing. La, la, la. parasympathetic breathing. Can you say that three times fast using Mr. Lips and Mr. Tongue? Um, <laughs> um, and when you, it turns out we have two nervous systems. We have something called the sympathetic nervous system, which revs us up for action. It's the system that says there's an emergency. We need resources. We have to spring into action right now. Right now. And it's a survival response. This is why we have jokes like just hand over the chocolate and nobody gets hurt because every bone in your body feels like you need to do this now, no matter what you rationally thought before. It pushes your rational being out of the way. However, strategic thinking, resting, digesting, planning is also a survival advantage. As a matter of fact, in many ways, it's a bigger survival advantage. So we have the capacity to do that as well. It's just that our brains are wired for emergencies to overtake that system. Emer emergencies take precedence. So when your brain perceives there to be a false emergency, a certain level of organismic distress, it goes into action and it says, um, you better get those calories now. So your sympathetic nervous system is the system that's active when you're about to break your rules and, and especially when you're binging. It turns out that the type of breathing you do in yoga, which you don't have to go to a yoga class to do, is called parasympathetic breathing. And it takes you out of an urgent doing mode into more of a relaxed being mode. It takes you into a mode which says it's okay to rest and digest and think and plan. Your long-term goals are more important now than your immediate pleasure or your immediate needs. Um, and it's really easy. If you breathe out for longer than you breathe in. My, my friend Lori Hammond calls it a 7-Eleven breath. She'll instruct people to breathe in for a count of seven and out for a count of 11, which I'm not doing because it takes some time now. Um, you begin to signal the brain that there's no emergency because let's face it, if I was running from a hungry bear, I would be getting as much air as I could as quickly as I could. I wouldn't have time to breathe out longer than I breathe in. I'd be going... <laughs> So when I calmly and confidently breathe out for longer than I'm breathing in, I'm telling my brain, no, everything's okay. We can chill. There's no urgency here. So if you do that, the moment that you hear your pig squealing, you know, trying to give you some rationalization for breaking your rule, you're going to have a better chance of calming down and thinking and remembering why you made the rule in the first place.
And then you write down why the pig said that you should do this. So, and then you disempower it. Um, so you can open up that space by practicing at every meal, practicing going one, two, three for a while, then practicing the seven, 11 breaths for a while. and kind of adding more and more space. Once the space is even further open, and you do this before every meal, like right before every meal. So you, you're actually rewarding it with the food. You're teaching your brain that in order to acquire calories, you have to calm down and pause first. Um, yeah. most, pe most people who have a puppy go through some kind of process like this, where they ask their puppy to sit and, you know, wait and be, be kind of sweet and calm before they feed it. You're supposed to do that anyway. <laughs> um, you, you're teaching your brain to be a calm puppy, not a crazy puppy when you do that. You can go even further if you open the space and you can have little mantras like my pig says one bite won't hurt, but one bite is a tragedy. It's a difference between who's in charge, me or my pig, right? Mm -hmm. And you can, if you say that before you eat every time, then rather than hearing the thought one bite won't hurt when you when your pig wants to justify eating something, you'll start to reflect reflexively think, no one bites a tragedy. It's the difference between who's in charge, me or the pig. So you can do that. There is even more, however, um, because you can, I, I thought this is all you had to do to recover. And this is all I did to recover for really the first seven or eight years that I was overcoming this myself, which it, um, when I started working with people, we spent another seven or eight years getting this process down to, you know, just about a month in in in, in time period. Um, and we got an 89.4% reduction in overeating after one month for the people who engaged with our, our techniques. Um, I used to think that just fixing your thinking was all you had to do. You need to open up enough of a space and fix your thinking. But in the last year or so, before I wrote the new book, I discovered that when I looked at the longer term results, it was, uh, I would get what we would call bimodal. So at, at one month, it was about 89.4% of the people had, uh, we got an 89.4% reduction in overeating. But at six months, it was more like 55%. And at the six month mark, there was a group of people that had continue to use the techniques they were doing really well, almost as well as they'd done before. And there's a group of people who just dropped out. And that's why the overall number went down. So I said, why are people dropping out? Because this seems like such a powerful technique and it's so much more comfortable to eat well than to be overeating all the time and carry the extra weight and feel, you know, bloated and gross and like out of control. Like what, why were people dropping out? Yeah, and so many times those people then carry the weight of the guilt as well. So I love that you're looking to help them. Of course, of course. What I found was that the answer inevitably was there came a time when they heard a little voice in their head that said, screw it, just do it. I don't have any good excuses. I've disempowered all my excuses. I fixed all my thinking about fooled, but oh, well, what the hell? Screw it, just do it. I said, what is going on with that? And I kind of thought back in retrospect, and I had had some times like that in my own recovery too. And it turns out that everything that's going on there would fall under the rubric of um, organismic distress, um, which required more self-regulation. So one of the biggest things was if people weren't eating regularly, if they weren't you know, flooding their body with nutrition on a regular basis, if they were skipping meals, if they were eating really sugary foods a lot, if they were throwing their dopamine or their blood sugar off by, you know, lots of pasta or white flour or, you know, all the things we all know that we're not supposed to do, or at least not supposed to do too much. Um, if that was in their food plan too much, then they would get thrown off and they just couldn't seem to, to stave off that screw it, just do it response. But it was really hard to work with people about their nutrition. Um, Margaret Mead said, it's easier to get somebody to change their religion than to change their diet. Mm -hmm. And we find that to be true. So my, my program is diet agnostic. You can do it on any reasonably nutritious diet that you want to follow. I'm not going to tell you what to eat or what you can't eat. And 
we can talk more about why it's possible to have things that aren't necessarily nutritious and still control yourself a little down the road if you want to. Um, but so there, but there were also things like not getting enough sleep, not having enough water, um, feeling too isolated, um, having to make too many decisions over the course of the day. It turns out that willpower is the ability to make good decisions. And it's not really a genetic gift. It's more like we all have a certain amount we wake up with. It's like gas in the tank. And every time you make decisions, not just food decisions, every decision, you are burning a little bit of that gas. And so when people are making decisions all day long, they're handling emails. Do I delegate it? Do I defer it? Do I delete it? Do I um, take care of it right now? They're figuring out who's going to take Jenny to soccer practice and what am I going to wear today and what time am I going to drive home and when are we going to go to the movies? When you're making decisions all day long, eventually you reach this state of organismic, or, organismic distress where you say, no more, I can't control myself anymore. So we found that if we had people take a couple of 10 minute breaks over the course of the day, even five minute breaks, where you put your phone down, turn off your computer, go hide in the bathroom if you have to, but get away from decisions for five or 10 minutes, twice a day, take a couple of deep breaths. It, this works optimally better if you get outside and get some fresh air, but I know not everybody can do that. Um, and that made a difference. Then some people were feeling too isolated. They just hadn't had enough contact with their tribe. And we found you don't have to be a social butterfly, but you, you do need to feel like there are people around you who care, um, who you could reach out to if you wanted to, because we're a pack animal and in primitive times, if you were too isolated, you were in danger. Like we, we didn't really live, you know, alone in the bush. We were, we were not able to necessarily feed ourselves and protect ourselves without, without the tribe. And so it leads to a certain amount of organismic distress when you don't have a, a bit of a community around you. Um, not drinking enough water, um, everything that you would associate with self-care. Um, in order to really recover and stave off that screw it, just do it response, which you can beat with the breathing and the thinking when you get really tough with it. But to really stave it off and give yourself the maximal chance, you need to focus on all of these elements of self-care at the same time. And, and you need to understand that if when you're of sound mind and body, you use your best thinking to come up with a rule you'd like to follow, but that's really a sacred thing. That's a sacred practice. It's um, it's not really just a rule. It's it's a way of being that you're trying to adopt in your life. You know, J Jim Rohn said a life of discipline is better than a life of of regret. Uh, Peter McWilliams said you can have anything you want, but you can't have everything you want. And when you can define a center like that for yourself, there is a uh, there's a calmness and a centeredness and an ability to walk in the world as a mindful person that emerges that you'll become more and more addicted to and more and more upset when you relinquish to the impulses of your reptilian brain or, you know, the the perils of modern food society. So um, I think now I've answered your question. I'm sorry I went on for a half hour. <laughs> no, it's yeah. such great information. And I just want to make certain everyone knows I am with Dr. Glenn Livingston, who wrote a book called Defeat Your Cravings, has an amazing, amazing website. You actually give away a lot of free information as well. And all I can estimate, but I would love a confirmation, is that part of the reason you do that is because you know the plight you know the journey and you know that it has to begin with a step but tell us about the site and what you what you offer around this to build a community because you're right if you don't have a community that you feel understands you then you feel like you're trumping up the hill all by yourself and you know what's going to be at the top who cares i'm by myself so overeating was the bane of my existence <clears throat> i mean i I was not able to be as effective as a psychologist as I really wanted to be because I'd be thinking about, you know, when can I get the next pizza? Um, you know, there, there were times when I'd go to seven different drive throughs so that nobody knew how much I was, I was eating. I was always thinking about like, how do I make up for this? Do I need to hide the evidence? Because I, I was embarrassed. I, not because anybody made fun of me for it, because I was embarrassed. Um, you know, am I... Am I someone who's 
walking in integrity because I'm, you know, I, I wasn't working with overeaters originally. I was a child and family psychologist, but still I felt like, um, you know, I'm supposed to be a model of health. I'm, I'm a health professional. I'm supposed to be a model of health and everybody could see that I was significantly overweight. And um, this was the bane of my existence. So I organized a business model which would help people who couldn't afford to pay me anything. I mean, obviously we have service of service. We have services for money. We have some versions of the book that are paid, but um, you know, I wanted to be able to reach a million people a year um, and help them stop overeating without them ever paying me a dime if they couldn't afford it. And so I give away the book for free in electronic format. So Kindle, Nook, PDF, um, that's all free. We have traditional formats at traditional prices, Audible, um, you know, Audible paperback hardcover. And um, we do have a community that's free. We have, a, you can find that on the website also. Um, we have a, a free community and then we have a, we have a paid set of coaching services for people who want either myself or one of my coaches to walk them through this step by step. I, and I've recorded, um, well, really, really hundreds at this point. I've recorded hundreds of demonstration interviews and expert interviews so that I know that this sounds like a little bit of a cold process. Like why, why, why is there a doctor with a pig inside of him on this, on this call today? Um, it sounds a little cold and harsh, but when you actually hear me, people hear me coach people through a full length session, you're going to see how it transforms them from feeling hopeless and powerless and confused about food to feeling, you know, hopeful and excited and optimistic in, in just one session. Um, so it's a very compassionate life-giving process. And I wanted you to be able to hear that and learn from their experience and, you know, hear a lot of success stories. And um, yeah, it's at defeaturecravings.com. Just click the big blue button at defeaturecravings.com and sign up for the reader bonus list and you'll get all that and more. Yeah. And I had the honor of listening to the audible version and you read it, which is wonderful because then again, it makes you feel closer to the individual who created the program and you share your story. What we do is oftentimes we don't take the time to understand that you or whomever's created these systems, they went through it. You know what it's like to be where someone's starting right now who's saying, I am committed to this, but I just don't know where to start. I don't know where to take that first step. And then as we know, it's pretty common knowledge that it takes about six weeks to break a habit. So if we can just hold on to that length of time, and then you've done all the research to show how you make it past that six week mark to keep this flowing. Mm -hmm. So you have all of this insight and inside knowledge because you went through it. And because you know what it's like to be sitting where someone is sitting right now going, I feel helpless. I feel helpless to my cravings. I feel helpless to my lifestyle. I don't know how my lifestyle would fit in all of this conscious focus because I can barely focus for 15 minutes on the things I need to do at work. So when someone comes to you and says, I've attempted breath work, I've attempted many of these things what can you do to like take me to that next level because I feel so defeated in myself? What can your program offer someone? Well, we, we try to walk it back and make it as simple as possible. Like I, I don't need you to spend an hour a day contemplating your, na your navel. Um, I, I don't need you to have, you know, a deep spiritual insight or anything like that. Um, I do need you to be willing to go one, two, three before you eat. If that's all you did, like if that's all you take away from the whole interview and from now on, just before you eat anything, you go one, two, three, and observe all the reluctance and, you know, um, disturbance that comes up inside when you try to do that. Um, you know, you, you'll, you'll get a win. You'll get a win. You'll, you'll start to feel slightly calmer about food and then make it really, really simple. What your first rule is like, Maybe you always put your fork down between bites, or maybe you just don't eat in front of the TV. Or there was this truck driver who said he's got to eat fast food three times a day, but his first rule was that he wouldn't go back for seconds. So he could eat whatever he wanted to, he just wouldn't go back for seconds. And he had so much success with that, that he went on to lose 150 pounds, adding more rules and, and 
you know, facilitating um, facilitating a success identity, um, just starting with something really, really, really simple. So we we dial it way back and we make it very possible for people to achieve something when they never thought they could achieve that before. So that that that's what we do. Um, you know, and then a lot of these, uh, when I read the book, I'm substantially calmer. I get a little nervous on these interviews and I speak really quickly because there's a lot of information that goes into it. But um, there is a lot more information about why you've struggled up until this point, why it's been such a, a difficult struggle to this point. There, there's so much obfuscation of the truth in cultural mythology about food. Like, like people will tell you that you should just eat well 90% of the time and eat badly 10% of the time or indulge yourself 10% of the time. But they don't tell you how to distinguish the 90% from the 10%. So every time you're in front of a piece of cheesecake or a chocolate bar, you've got to make another food decision. And as I told you before, that wears down your willpower. As opposed to saying, I will only ever eat chocolate on Saturdays after a workout and no more than two ounces, right? To really define when and where and how. And that would involve you know, eating well about 90% of the time and, and indulging about 10% of the time. But your decisions are made for you. You don't have to make chocolate decisions all week long. You're not wearing down your willpower. Um, people are frightened of hard and fast rules. They'll say, well, what if I make a mistake and then I'm going to feel too guilty and I've got way too much guilt to start with. And I, I tell them that the psychology of winning could be emulated from an Olympic archer. Um, when Olympic archer aims at the bullseye, they commit with perfection. They can actually, before they let go of the arrow, they call it losing the arrow, they can see the arrow going into the target. They're almost one with the bullseye. Now they don't hit the bullseye 100% of the time, not even the, the winningest Olympic archers, but they aim with perfection, they commit with perfection because otherwise this, this doubt and insecurity overcomes them and that drains their energy from focusing on the target. And so they win significantly less. So what our culture will tell you is aim with progress, not perfection. What that means when it comes to food is just try for, for a little while until you don't feel like it anymore. And that's why people are constantly having so much struggles. Now, if you miss the target, what does an Olympic archer do? The Olympic archer says, by how much and in what direction did I miss the bullseye? And what does that mean for how I should adjust my aim? Because most people are loath to define a very specific bullseye. They don't know by how much and in what direction. And so they can't take advantage of the natural learning process of forgiving yourself, you know, gathering all the information you can from the miss, and then making adjustments to your aim and learning again. So I tell people what you need to do is commit with perfection, but forgive yourself with dignity, as opposed to the advice in the culture, which is oh, just progress, not perfection, you know, no matter what. And that's really stopping people from moving forward. People think that a rule will make you feel too rebellious, and you can't tolerate that feeling of rebellion. And there are some methodologies which suggest uh, that you can overcome eating problems by allowing yourself to eat everything and anything whenever you want to, as much as you want to, but you just try to eat mindfully. Um, I they, they work for some people. Those people will come to me and complain that they're not eating as healthy as they want to, that they would like to have the ability to eat healthier. And I'll tell them that in my experience, because remember, I, I work for the food industry, that the food industry is really broken, are hungry and full meters because there's so many unnatural foods on the market. It's, it's just, you know, I can walk downstairs across the street to the convenience store and I could buy 100,000 calories for less than $100 easily. Where, we, where could you get that on the Savannah? You could not get 100,000 calories for that little amount of effort. And, and so, you know, first of all, there's the availability of these enormous food resources. Secondly, there's the absence of nutrition in those food resources. So you have the calories, but not the nutrition, and that creates the addiction and makes you, makes it, like it's very, very difficult to get full on potato chips because you're not getting the nutrition that you need from potato chips. Um, I hope I don't get sued by a potato chip company, but there might be some minuscule amount of, but nobody thinks they're having a nutritious lunch when they have a bag of potato chips or 12 bags of potato chips. 
And so the idea that we should just mindfully eat everything when we're living with an industry that has chemicals in the packaging that can break our ability to know when we're full, that is not providing us the nutrition to feel satisfied, that is concentrating calories in such an extreme amount, to think that you should use natural defenses against such unnatural offenses, I, I don't think that makes sense. I think we really need to, um, at some point you have to be able to step back and say, that's not food at least for me. Doug Graham told me that there's cardboard in the food system. There's legal cardboard in the food system. And at some point, somebody has to stand up and say, that's not food. That's I, I'm not going to eat cardboard mindfully. I'm just not going to do it. Um, okay. Agreed. And ultimately, when you think about the fact that it isn't just that we're being fooled on a physical standpoint with lack of nutrition, but on a mental standpoint with the way that it's packaged, the way that it's presented, the way that it's marketed, you know, it is a constant barrage on the physical and mental front. So having rules that help you recognize that, it's amazing. And, and then also there's the idea that you have to let your emotions rule the roost. Like I tell people what you want to do is sever the link between your emotions and overeating. You need to be able to eat with your head. Most people don't like this idea, but it, it's very powerful. They, they want to be able to eat when they feel like eating. But if you adopt the principle of severing that link, kind of like building a, that fireplace around the roaring fire, then you can eat well if you're really anxious. You can eat well if you're really depressed. You can eat well if you're really angry or hungry or lonely or tired. Um, you can eat well if you feel really rebellious. I don't want to be a slave to my emotions. I want to be the master of my own fate. And so I tell people, why do you have to reify that inner rebel? Why do you have to treat that inner rebel like it's a queen or a king? So what if, if a rule makes you feel really rebellious? Why can't you feel rebellious but make the decision with your head instead? Just the important ones. Not I'm not telling you not to be spontaneous at all about food. It's just like um, when you're driving around town, you follow the rules about which lights to stop at and which lights to yield at and you know, what do you do with a four-way stop sign? And you, you know the rules of the road. It doesn't stop you from living your life. It doesn't stop you from enjoying the drive. As a matter of fact, the rules of the road are what make it possible for you to expand your radius of locomotion and freely navigate the city and go see your friends and family and for commerce to occur. The rules of the road are what are what underlie our freedom. Um, they're not, they're not a anathema to our freedom. They're not, they're not opposed to our freedom. Um, just like a, a jazz musician can't express their soul unless they know the structure of music. A jazz musician has, actually has to study the structure of music more so than a classical musician because they have to know where that underlying structure is so they can improvise away from it. So I, I'm very strongly in favor of a clearly defined target so you can learn as much as you can from all of your misses so you can collect evidence of success rather than evidence of failure if you collect evidence of success and ask what did i do right did i have five cupcakes instead of 15 how did i do that how can i have four next time um, if you keep asking those kind of questions how can i stop overeating you will build a success identity rather than what our society mostly teaches us, which is I screwed up again, I'm pathetic, why can't I stop eating what's wrong with me? You say, why can't I stop eating what's wrong with me? You're directing your brain to go find evidence that you can't stop eating and that there's something wrong with you. If you keep directing your brain like that, you're gonna believe it. You're gonna find enough evidence and you're gonna believe it. So you wanna collect evidence of success instead of failure. Um, and I forgot exactly what started that whole tirade. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, it's okay. all great information. I have one final question as we wrap up, because it was one that I found very interesting from the book. And that is the individuals who say it's genetics. Genetics yeah. have me bound to where I'm at in my life right now. So no matter what I do, I'm helpless to my gene code. Mm -hmm. What do you have to say about the role that genetics play? It plays a role. Um, diet and lifestyle are more important. So I was handed, in some ways, I was handed a good genetic deck of cards in some way, a very bad one. Um, my parents were obese and their parents were obese. And just about everybody in the family had a heart attack in their 40s. Um, but through focusing on diet and lifestyle, even though 
you know, I probably ate more than everybody else in my family, my fair share, um, you know, until I was 40. I cleaned it up and I got involved with the right exercises and I arranged a diet and lifestyle and I will be 60 in August. And um, so far, so good. So far, so good. So um, even if, so it, the problem is that the pig says because of your genetics that you're doomed to be heavy and therefore you should just give up. Even if it's true that you have a very poor genetic deck of cards, does that mean you shouldn't try to be as healthy as possible? Should you try to get as fat as possible because you have a poor genetic deck of cards? Even if it were true that it's a very, very bad hand, um, does, well, I think I, I'm just repeating myself. So, you know, I think that genetics does play a role and it gives us a higher mountain to climb. But so what? You can still climb the mountain. It just takes a little longer and you got to work a little harder at it. Yeah. And as you said, you know that climb, that's the genetics you came from. So you share so much of your own personal story throughout the book as well. And then you add in the knowledge that you've acquired through all of the research, all of the studies, all of the self-study of how something impacted you as you were navigating this system, that it really is something that gives hope to individuals that I know in my life right now feel a little bit hopeless around their ability to calm their cravings. And, you know, they've attempted different systems, but you have a pathway that says, okay, if this system doesn't fit, there's another system. Don't just think it has to be one system. Mm -hmm. And so I greatly encourage individuals to, if this is an area of focus for them or for someone they care about, just go download all of the free resources you have available at defeatyourcravings.com and explore and get to know you. Because in our first conversation, I immediately knew that you have a passion and a dedication for this. It isn't just something that you thought, oh, here's a cool program. Let's talk well, about I, I, can, I can make a lot more money doing other things. <laughs> I've, su I've suffered a lot um, because of my dedication to this, but but um, yeah, but this is this is a work of passion. It's, it's um, you know, we make a living with it also, but it's a work of passion. So thank you for recognizing that. That means a lot to me. Well, and thank you for placing it out there. It means a lot to us that you have both free resources and paid for resources. That way anyone can take those first few steps. Thank so. you so much. It's been a pleasure. It's and been a pleasure. Likewise. Yeah. And I hope this is just the beginning of many things that we can do together. I'm looking forward to that. All right. Again, Dr. Glenn Livingston, his book is Defeat Your Cravings. And if you just go to defeatyourcravings.com, you can find a whole bunch of free resources and get to know Dr. Livingston on a much deeper level. But this hour you've shared with us helps us do that. So thank you again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.